It's been four weeks since the release of Lethal Company version 50. And since then, me and my assistant Richard have been hard at work supporting the company the best we can. Speaking of which, Richard, Richard, you coming? Well, what are you gonna do? This update has brought with it three brand new moons and some hefty rebalancing to old moons. So you know what that means. It's time to go back to an old classic and mathematically re-rank every single moon in Lethal Company from least profitable to most profitable with a new and improved method. This is the statistically best moon in Lethal Company. Richard hit that itch. Oh yeah, he's dead. Huh. Not really sure what the, uh, the protocol here. Ah! As many of you may know, this isn't the first time I've tried to rank every moon like this. In fact, I've already made a whole spreadsheet to calculate this stuff for me. So this video could be as simple as updating the data, throwing in a few more moons, and we'd have the results in a matter of seconds. It could be so easy. Only there's one problem. In that original video, I was assuming that you and your crew were of an average skill level. I figured most people who play this game are only making one, maybe two runs in a day, they're not messing around with beehives or nutcracker drops too much, and they're probably dying a fair amount. But I'd like to take this moment to issue an apology. For it seems that I have underestimated, nay, insulted all of you. For it is clear now that you are not of average skill. As a lot of you pointed out, if you're at the point where you're trying to do statistical optimization, you're probably a little more experienced than your average Lethal Company player. So today, I'm building a brand new decision matrix that will not only statistically rank each and every moon in the game, but it will also adapt to your crew's skill level. For those who don't know or need a refresher, a decision matrix is a statistical model that converts a bunch of data in different criteria into a simple standardized score out of 10 possible points. It's a fairly simple process and in proper lethal company fashion can be completed in just three days. The first step in the decision matrix process is to select our criteria, all the things that we want to judge these moons on. The goal is to find the most profitable moon, so the most obvious place to start is with, well, your profits. Every single moon has its own unique table of items that can spawn, how much each of those items can be worth, and their percent chance of spawning. In order to find out which moon is the most reliably profitable, we need to take the weighted average of all the pieces of loot. We can do this by multiplying each piece of loot's average value by its percent chance to spawn, and then taking the sum of every piece of loot that can spawn in a given moon. So as an example, on experimentation, the metal sheet is one of the most common items, only worth an average of 16 bucks. The gold bar is the most valuable item at 156 bucks, but it's also incredibly rare. So if you go to experimentation a whole bunch of times, you can expect to make $31.72 per item you bring back. We can repeat this same process for every moon to find the average loot value. But we're not done yet, because profit isn't just about the quality of the loot you find, it's also about the quantity. That brings us to our next criterion, the max loot capacity. Each moon has a set limit for the total number of items that it can spawn. Experimentation can spawn 8 to 11, while the new artifice can spawn up to 37. 
For less experienced crews, this limit might not matter all too much, but a well-practiced crew could pretty easily clean out all 11 items on experimentation with time to spare. And as every good employee knows, time spared is time wasted. In these cases, having more loot available is incredibly important. Just looking at the total amount of loot in a given moon isn't the full story though. Obviously, each moon's interior is randomly generated every visit. But have you ever wondered why March's factory always seems twice as big as experimentations? That's because it's literally twice as big. Each moon has a map size multiplier that determines how big the interior can be. The larger the map, the further you have to go to find the loot you're looking for. To account for this, we can divide each map's map size multiplier by the average number of items that it can spawn to find the loot density. This is the amount of items that can spawn per standard map size. Basically, the higher the density, the easier it is to find stuff. The next factor we need to account for is danger. As my assistant Richard so helpfully demonstrated for us, it doesn't matter how valuable the loot on a moon is if you can't stay alive to get any of it back. Amateur. Last time, I used the in-game danger ratings to approximate this, but in hindsight, that method was a little flawed, owing to the fact that these ratings, uh, suck. According to the game, experimentation and adamance have the same difficulty, even though I'm pretty sure nobody has ever died on experimentation a single time. And I swear every time I go to Adamant's, I'm getting mugged by a pack of baboon hawks or a giant that spawned right in the middle of the path or a flock of birds that picked me up and flew me right into a swarm of bees. Objectively, quantifying a moon's difficulty is tricky because it's largely subjective. Some people may think that the eyeless dogs are a piece of cake to avoid, while mechanical keyboard users find them impossible. To try to keep this as objective as I can and not rank every single moon that has birds an automatic 10, I decided to use each moon's power value. Power is a measure of the number of monsters that can spawn on a given map. Certain monster types are worth different amounts of power, but by and large, the more power a moon has, the more stuff is going to try to kill you. Each moon has a power rating for indoor monsters and outdoor monsters, so to get a final score, I just added them together. Is this a perfect method? No. While moons with more power tend to have more dangerous monsters, it doesn't explicitly account for every enemy spawn rate, but it's at least a good enough approximation. And pro tip, regardless of what danger ratings I assign, if you keep dying every single time you go to Titan, maybe just stop going to Titan. Last time, this is where I stopped, but I want to include two more factors for our more advanced scrappers. The first is beehives, which can spawn on the exterior of certain moons. They're a bit tricky to get considering they're guarded by well, bees. But if your friend manages to bait the swarm away without getting murdered, then the hives are worth a ton of money. Each moon has a different chance to spawn hives, and the higher the percentage, the more hives you'll probably get. And the final criterion is enemy loot. The Nutcracker and the Butler monsters both carry items that don't count towards the maximum loot total for a moon. It's just bonus money that you can grab. There's just one problem, and that's that those items are a shotgun and a knife that they're using to try to kill you. I'll be honest, last time I totally forgot about this because I don't think I've ever survived an encounter with a Nutcracker, but if you and your friend simply beat this kind old butler to death with a shovel in his own home, then you can nab yourself some extra cash.
Are we the bad guys? Oh, B! Similar to the first step, we can take the weighted average of the enemy loot by using the spawn chance of the butlers and the nutcrackers and the average value for the shotgun and the kitchen knife to get our final criterion. Great, we've got all the data, but in its current form, it's not super helpful. Everything's on different scales. We've got things in dollars, PowerPoints, percentages. In order to turn this into a simple score, we need to standardize everything or simply just make everything here on a scale from one to 10. This will make it far easier to compare things to one another later on. As you may remember from last time, doing this is fairly simple. We can just use this formula to make the highest value in any given criterion a 10 and everything else scaled down from there. This works for everything except for danger, where a higher score means that more monsters can spawn. Here, we want a moon with the lowest danger score to be a 10. So we can use this slightly more complicated formula to flip our scale and then scale it down. Dang, is it just me or is, is day two feel way shorter than the last one? Now we have everything nice and standardized. The final step is to assign weights. This is how we measure how important each criterion is. Typically, I'd select one set of weights, but today we're gonna get a little more complicated. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I wanna make this video applicable to players of any skill level, and players of differing abilities will value different things. So to account for this, I've created not one, but three sets of weights. One for beginner baby crews. Oh no, a slime, let me run away. One for just your average Joes. Mondays, am I right? And one for the lethal company elites that don't run from monsters. Monsters run from them. The loot value is weighted at 50% every time. No matter how good you are, moons with more valuable loot are gonna be better. For a level one cruise, the danger level and loot density are weighted fairly high. At this level, you're probably not super familiar with all the different monsters and how to avoid them, so you want a moon where you can get in, quickly get a bunch of loot, and get out safely. Maximum scrap is weighted pretty low because you're probably not clearing out any moons yet. Hives are weighted at just 1%, I mean, sure, you can go for them, but based on personal experience, you're probably gonna have to sacrifice two to three people to actually get it, and enemy loot is at zero. Look, I'm sorry, I have the utmost faith in you, but you ain't killing a nutcracker. As the skill level increases, the loot density and danger weights go down. As you become better at the game, you can confidently spend more time in the facility without dying, so the loot being tightly packed isn't as essential. Meanwhile, scrap maximum, enemy loot, and hives become much more important as you become better able to capitalize on them. Hopefully this tiered weighting system will make the final results more applicable to a wider range of people. But if you're still not happy with my weights, Great news. I've included a link to my spreadsheet with all this data in the description down below. If you want, you can throw your own weights in and it will automatically calculate new scores for you. If you're the kind of guy who says, screw everything else, we're going bees only, guess what? You can do that. But with that, we have arrived at the final day and the results are in. We've collected all the data, expanded our scope from the last attempt, and devised a new methodology to quantify skill. And it turns out that none of it mattered at all, because regardless of your skill, Artifice is inarguably the best moon in the game. The loot there is more valuable than any other moon in the game, there's more of it than any other moon in the game, and it's more densely packed than any other moon in the game. I mean, you're basically tripping over cash here. Sure, it's pretty dangerous and it's very expensive to get there, but if you can afford it, 
there's literally no reason not to go. Also, regardless of skill level, it turns out that fellow New Moon Embryon is complete trash. The loot there is no more valuable than the other easy moons, and it's incredibly dangerous at night, so much though so that it basically breaks my scale. Though, to be fair, this moon isn't supposed to be that good. It's more for people who want a challenge, so putting that to one side, offense and experimentation are pretty bad too. And for those curious, the third new moon introduced, Adamance, is... Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's not the best free moon, it's not the worst, it's just okay. So, now that we've done all the work and have all the results, we can pinpoint the statistically best strategy for getting through as many quotas as possible for a crew of any skill level. For beginners, start by going to Assurance. The loot there is only a buck less valuable on average than medium moons like March and Adamant's, but the loot density is much higher, so you'll have an easier time actually getting it. If you can't go to Assurance because of weather, try Vow or Experimentation. Don't bother with the medium moons if you're not confident in your ability to survive. The loot there isn't any more valuable than the easy moons, there's just more of it. When you have enough money and want to try your hand at a hard moon, always go for Rend. Just like last time, it's overall better than both Titan and Dine, despite being the cheapest of the three. For intermediate crews, Vow and March are good options if you want to try and get a couple hives. Or if you're not interested in that, honestly, Assurance is still a very strong option. Once you have enough money, you can go to Rend. It's significantly better than the other free moons, though honestly, you might be better off saving your money to get to Artifice as soon as you can. And for the true lethal company phenoms out there, the game plan is simple. Step one, go to March. Farm as many hives as you can and clean the inside out. Step two, get to Artifice ASAP. Step three, profit. And there you have it. Statistically ranking every single moon to find the most optimal strategy for a crew of any skill level. Now go forth with the power of knowledge, my scrappers, and make the company proud. Oh, hey, Richard, you're back. What's going on? Hey, uh, what's that shovel for? R Richard. Richard, what's that shovel for? Richard, no, no, no. Oh, there's bees over here. This video was made possible by all my patrons, including Alakazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for to Win, Sidian, Sherry and Mark, The Boss Killer94, and Alberung Freud and Selican. You guys are the greatest. <laughs>